Hi everyone, my name is Brent Johnson and I've got a wealth management business in San Francisco where I manage money for high net worth individuals. Um, I've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, through Santiago Capital, I do some uh, alternative investment and advisory work and I'm also part of a firm called Baker Avenue Asset Management where traditional assets are custodied. And today I'm going to talk to you about two of my favorite subjects with this uh, dollar and gold. Um, now, they're often seen as competitors, if not mortal enemies, uh, but in my opinion, before it's all said and done, they're, they're going to rise together. Um, but eventually, there will only be one left. Uh, now, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I typically find when somebody has a strong opinion about either gold or the dollar, it's mainly because they've come to the conclusion that the fiat money system is kind of out of control, they've printed all this money, they've borrowed all this debt, it can't be paid off, so they're going to have to print it until it all goes away. So. Raise your hand if you've heard this argument before. Okay. So I tend to agree with that, but probably not in exactly the same way that you think. Because while I definitely think the monetary system is going to come to an end, I think it's the dollar's strength which is going to kill it and not the weakness. So why do I think that? Well, this is a graph of the dollar going back to its all-time high in the mid-80s. And as you can see, for the last 10 years, it's kind of been rising in this kind of descending wedge or ascending wedge. And I think we are now at the stages, uh, early stages of what I consider to be a perfect dollar storm. And what I mean by that is um, I don't think we could design a more perfect short squeeze on the dollar if we set out to do so. And I think before it's all said and done, it's going to go back to its all-time highs. And the knock-on effects, I think, will shock everybody, in including those of us who are actually waiting for it to happen. Um, now, why do I think this is going to happen? Why do I think it's going to go back to its all-time highs? Well, mainly, um, anybody who's ever heard me speak before, uh, you know, I never just come up and just throw up a bunch of charts and graphs. So I'm going to use a couple movies, um, one called The Prestige, which is a movie about magic and revenge, one called There Will Be Blood, which is a movie about the cutthroat oil business and, funnily enough, milkshakes, and then finally Highlander, which is a movie about these immortals who travel through time having these epic battles along the way. Um, now, I'm going to read something from the very beginning of the movie The Prestige because I think it sets it up very well. And the magician's assistant, he says, every great magic trick consists of three parts or acts. The first part's called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary, a deck of cards, a bird, or a man. The second act is called the turn. The magician takes something ordinary and makes it do something extraordinary. Now, you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it because, of course, you're not really looking. You don't really want to know. But you still won't clap yet because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. And that's why every magic trick has a third act called the prestige. Now just to show you that whether you believe in magic or not, it can be an effective tool, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. On the next page, I'm going to give you an example. And when I go to the next slide, I'm going to ask you guys to pick a card. Is everybody ready? Okay, so pick a card, look at that one card, stare at the card, Focus exclusively on that one card, memorize it, because in three, two, one, I'm going to make it disappear. Did it work? Okay. So I use this movie because, make no mistake, the central bankers and monetary authorities are amongst the greatest sleight of hand and magic experts alive today. After the global financial crisis, they started a magic trick of their own. Their pledge was that everything was okay. We've got all these bad debts under control. In the turn, they actually did make them disappear. They hid all these bad debts on the central bank balance sheets. Now, initially, the most aggressive magician was the Federal Reserve, and they printed enough money to expand the monetary base by 400 percent. The idea was to not only make the bad debts disappear, but inflate away the dollar so the still existing debts were easier to pay off. And this is where a secondary trick was also attempted by some non-U.S. magicians. Since the dollar was going to get inflated away, these non-U.S. actors borrowed an additional $11 trillion, or they doubled their exposure to U.S. dollar debt, taking it up to about $11 trillion, which is double in the last 10 years. Now, keep this in mind, because we're going to come back to it after a while. Now, many of this, us in this room probably tried the same trick. We knew what the central banks were up to. We knew they were trying to inflate away the dollar. So we bought gold in the anticipation of it being inflated away. Um, and we got rid of our dollars and, and bought something, you know, a real asset, whether it was gold or silver or, or the like. And this brings me to Highlander. This is the story about the immortals who only can be killed when their heads get cut off. The Kurgan on the left is the biggest and the baddest of all the immortals. 
let's think of him as the dollar. And Connor McLeod on the right, he's our hero. He's more of a poet than a fighter, and he's not really interested in fighting. He just wants to be left alone. Now, it becomes very clear early on in the movie that these two are bound to fight an epic battle. But the thing is, there's many battles that come before this one, before the ultimate showdown. And in many prior battles, it's the Kurgan who's running around the world cutting off other people's heads. And the way it works is when you cut off another immortal's head, all their power flows back to you. So by the time of the epic showdown, the, the Kurgan is bigger and stronger than anybody else. And I really think that's what's going on with the dollar right now. Everybody's focused on the end game between dollars and gold. But in the meantime, the dollar's going to run around and cut every other fiat currency's head off. And all that capital and all that, gold, or all that power is going to flow back into the dollar. So what about the dollar demand? It, everybody tells me that you know, there's this de-dollarization effort going on and the dollar's losing demand. Well, that's not actually true. There's a lot of demand for the dollar from many different sources. And even if we've, and uh, you know, whether it's the interest to pay the existing debt, the interest to pay the non-US debt, um, the global funding currency of the world, or the demand for new debt from the US Treasury. So if we just look at the demand for debt service alone, if you look at the dollar debt in the world, and you just consider the debt service for that dollar debt, there's about 40 trillion of dollar debt and if that was all issued at 2.3%, which is the average rate on the outstanding U.S. Treasury, you're talking about $850 billion a year just to service the dollar-based debt. Forget about repayments, forget about any trade, just to service the dollar debt. So that's an incredible amount of dollar demand just to service the existing debt. Not only that, but despite all its flaws, the U.S. dollar is still far and away the biggest funding currency in the world. Almost everyone all over the world uses it to some extent. And because they've used it for funding, they can't walk away from it until they've paid off that debt. Treasury issuance is often cited as a reason for the dollar to get weak. The, dollar, the U.S. is borrowing more money. They can never pay it off. They're going to have to inflate it away. And in the long term, this is true. But in the short term, this is demand for dollars. The Treasury is going out to a pool of dollars and buying that from the market. That's an incredible amount of demand. The next argument is that China, Russia, and all these others will no longer buy our sovereign bonds because they don't want to fund us anymore. And that's true. They are decreasing their purchases. But this isn't new. This has been a declining trend for several years. And most of our budget is now financed from internal um, sources anyway. And if they were happy to buy our debt at 1.5%, they probably love it at 25 or 3 OK, so that helps explain demand a little bit. But what about supply? Can't supply just be expanded? Well, it can, but this is where we get back to uh, the prestige. Now, many tricks take more than one person to perform. And in this movie, when uh, the, the coordination failed, um, somebody died, and now it led to a bunch of revenge. And then in the real world here, we have two magicians who are no longer coordinating with the rest of the world. And each of them, in their own way, is making dollars disappear faster than you can say it. Trump's make it great again policies are starving the rest of the world of its most important export, and that is U.S. dollars. If trade doesn't take place, or if fewer trade takes place, fewer dollars circulate, and supply becomes harder to get. And this guy, not only is he not printing dollars anymore, he's actually raising rates, sucking dollars in from around the world and make it even harder for the competitors to compete with it. So what are other methods that lead to the dollar's continued use? Well, now let's talk about There Will Be Blood. Now, in this movie, Daniel Plainview was an oil man and as ruthless as they come. And he used every trick and tool available to take supply away from his competitors. And just like there are pipes, tubes, and hoses for the oil business, there's pipe, tubes, and hoses for the current monetary system. And it's through these existing pipes, tubes, and hoses that capital flows. These pipes, tubes, and hoses are controlled by the United States, specifically the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the CHIPS and SWIFT systems. And in the same way that they can let other countries use this system, they can also kick them out. And if you don't think that kicking them out is a big deal, just check out the economies of Turkey, Iran, North Korea, and to some extent Russia. Now, over the years, there's been many potential alternatives who have tried to be or have been believed to be the heir apparent to the global reserve. But the reality is, is they're all just pretenders. They don't even compare to the U.S. dollar. Now, don't get me wrong. De-dollarization trend is real. It is happening. Countries are fed up with the U.S. dollar. They hate that the U.S. uses it as a weapon, and they would very much like to de-dollarize. 
And there's always been black market ways to get around the official system. But these black market alternatives and these special purpose vehicles that are talked about are the basic equivalent of, uh, of hooking a garden hose up to a system like this that's currently existing. And if these, if, these, uh, you know, if these special purpose vehicles in these size channels are such a great system, then why do the competing currencies look like this? Why do their competing currencies continue to fall against the dollar? The bottom line is, is that forget even if you don't, if you could get everybody else in the room and the rest of the world to agree to lose, leave the dollar, and you could then agree which currency you're going to use, and then you could then agree which country is going to enforce it, the current, another system does not exist. There is no distribution channel for all the other currencies in the world, the same way that there is for the dollar. Okay, so what about future QE? Can't they just turn back on the printing presses and inflate away the dollar? Well, to understand that, you first have to understand that there's currently no intention to do that. Most economic indicators are currently better now than they were when they first started the rate hikes. And second reason is that it's not going to happen anytime soon for one very simple reason. The U.S. is no longer injecting money into the system. They've swapped out their syringe for a straw. And they're now using a straw that sucks up liquidity rather than a syringe to inject it like all our competitors. And that the Fed is now enabling the U.S. to drink the milkshake, the dollar milkshake and the currency milkshake that all the other countries out there are still printing. And this is probably the most famous scene from the movie There Will Be Blood, when Daniel explains to Eli, who has oil on his land, that all Daniel has to do is insert a straw from his side of the fence and he's going to drink Eli's milkshake. And this is exactly what the U.S. is currently doing. The rest of the world is still injecting QE or running massive budget surpluses, which we are as well. But we have the straw via higher interest rates, and we're sucking up all their stimulus. You can already see this happening. And this is why the dollar has been getting stronger over the last 12 months, and I think it's going to get even more so. Um, and now remember that pledge that we talked about back in 2008, as well as the side trick where the international entities borrowed in dollars? Well, now it's coming time for the third step, or the prestige. We all know it's time, or sorry. Let's look at two of the top three magicians that almost doubled their dollar exposure, dollar debt exposure since 2008, Turkey and Argentina. This is Turkey's lira from last year. It dropped almost 50%. Their stock market dropped at 45%. What about Argentina? They did the same thing. Well, their, their peso was down 50%, as was their stock market. This is basically the dollar Kurgan running around the world and chopping off other fiat currencies' heads. And these are just two examples. There's many, many more. Because the dollar repayment system, or I mean the, the maturity wall for emerging market debt is hitting now, and it's hitting big. They don't have another two or three years to prepare. This is $200 billion of debt that has to be repaid by emerging markets in the next 24 months. And I know we're so used to hearing about trillion dollar deficits here in the U.S. and in and some other though, or Western countries, but $200 billion for emerging markets is an incredible amount of money, especially when their economies are already hurting and the supply of dollars is falling. Now, the fantastic prestige that these uh, magicians were planning has failed miserably. Rather than paying off a depreciated dollar, they have to pay off an appreciated dollar, and there are not enough dollars to go around. In other words, there's no rabbit to be pulled out of the hat. The international, in, the international entity prestige is failing because there's no place else for capital to go. My, my friend Keith said for the U.S. dollar to crash, it means an enormous amount of funds have to leave the dollar and go somewhere else. Where do they go? Are they going to go to Europe? Well, this is a chart of the German stock market, the most stable and most important economy in Europe. And let me tell you, that is one ugly chart. Anybody want to buy that chart? What about, uh, not only that, but they have huge political problems. Both Mario Draghi and Merkel are on their way out. They've got huge uh, independence movements happening in Italy, Spain, and Greece. I mean, it's not going to be long before Junker is all alone and drinking by himself. <laughs> Let's skip that one. So where else is it going to go? Or are the, is the money going to flow into international bonds? Well, there's about $8 trillion worth of negative yielding bonds. How many people here want to buy a negative yielding bond where you have to pay the country to hold on to the bond for you. Anybody? Show of hands? No. Anybody hold dollars? Who owns dollars? 
Okay. A few people, more people own dollars than they do international bonds. Okay. What about international stocks? Now, this is a graph of all the, the equity indices around the world. Now, granted, the U.S. was down 6%. Nobody wants to be down 6%. But compared to everybody else who were down double digits, where would you rather own? Would you rather own Coca-Cola or do you want to own an emerging market stock? I don't know. Anybody buying emerging markets right now? Okay. So that brings us back to the epic showdown of dollar and gold. And here's the thing. We're just not ready for the end of the movie yet. The dollar Kurgan still has more heads to chop off. Now, people will tell me all the time, or sorry, let me go back one. Now, people tell me all the time that gold can provide a very elegant solution to the de-dollarization problem. And of course, this is true. This is why I've been pounding the table that everybody should own gold. Of course it will work. Of course it will save the few people who own it when the time comes. But regardless of the fact the rest of the world doesn't yet believe it, especially the people in the West, and even if they do, the governments of the world hate it. They've been working for 50 years to get it out of the system. They will fight its reintroduction with every fiber of their being. And then they'll often, often tell me that the, the ratio of physical gold available to the number of calls on it on the COMEX is way out of whack, over 200 to 1. And of course, again, this is true. But what people forget is that the same thing exists in dollars. There's only four, three and a half to $4 trillion of a U.S. monetary base. But there's at least 70 trillion claims on it. So the, the, the leverage ratio that all people often quote in, in gold actually also exists in dollars. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Now, this is another chart that people will often throw up to tell you, say why you should own gold. And again, I really believe in this chart. This is a great reason to own gold. But it basically shows about the, the, the least liquid instruments, how they flow down in some kind of a crisis down to the most liquid instrument and the highest powered money at the very bottom, which is gold. But you can't use this chart to be bullish gold and not also be bullish the dollar, because right above gold sits the dollar. And when everything cascades down, it cascades through the dollar before it goes to gold. Basically what I'm saying is as, as the money flows into the United States from around the world, the rest of the world is going to get the deflation, and these deflationary pressures are going to put even more pressure on them, and we are going to get the inflationary pressures from the flows of capital. It's basically a short squeeze. And I think what's going to happen is there is going to be less liquidity in the world. And it's going to get squeezed. And while it will lead to even less liquidity, the, li the little liquidity that there is is going to be traveling faster. And it's going to flow to the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is the United States. Now, first of all, or finally, I should say, I don't necessarily want this to happen. I don't necessarily think this is just. I don't necessarily think we deserve it. But it, it's not my job to sit up here and tell you what I want to happen. It's my job to come up here, analyze the world, and figure out what is going to happen. And this is what I think is going to happen. I think all the capital is going to flow back into the United States in this short squeeze. I think it's going to push the dollar back to its all-time high. I think euro yields are going to come under extreme pressure. I think European yields could easily double. They're really low now. They're lower than the U.S. Treasury. If the U.S. Treasury is the risk-free rate, why in the hell are these countries yielding rest less than the risk-free rate? It doesn't make any sense. Here's uh, the euro. I think the euro is going to go back to par with the dollar and eventually go much lower. This is, uh, I think, both Hong Kong and China go into recession, and I think the peg on both of them break. And when the peg on Hong Kong dollar and the, the Chinese yuan break, that's going to be really bad for copper. So I think copper goes a lot lower. This is the Australian dollar. As if Australia did not have enough troubles the way it was with their huge real estate bubble that is in the process of crashing, when China goes down, Australia is going to go down hard. I think the Australian dollar will fall 30 or 40% from here. And I don't have quite as big a conviction on this. I think oil is going to come under pressure as well. If you want to learn about oil, I met a guy named Art Berman yesterday, which I highly recommend you look him up because he has as much knowledge on the oil industry as anybody I've ever talked to. Gold is trying again to definitively break out of this uh, long-term trend or, or wedge that it's been into, and it might. You know, it's hit this level several times over the last couple of years, and every time it hits it, it goes down. I think with the dollar getting a lot stronger in the short term, I think gold goes lower. Um, I'm not telling you to go out and sell your gold. Everybody should own gold as an insurance policy against the craziness of the political, financial, and social madness that's probably coming. But it doesn't mean that the insurance policy is going to pay off right away. 
So I've met a lot of people who are certain that the gold is going to go higher, and I'm certain it is too. But the problem is, is many of these people have put 60, 70, 80% of their net worth into gold, and they don't have any liquidity from anywhere else to live. And if, you're, if you don't want to be selling gold at $1,000 to function your life, you need to, fit, you need to put some on the sideline right now. Now here's the, probably the most controversial part of my theory, is that I think the capital flows will actually push the U.S. stock market higher. I think we're in a correction right now, and the correction might go back and retest the lows we saw a month ago. But ultimately, I think U.S. stocks are going much higher before this is all said and done. I think we're going to have a massive blow off top. I think we're going to go to all time highs because I think U.S. stocks will be seen as a refuge from the storm when Europe, Asia, Australia, South America and all the other emerging markets come under pressure. And then the dollar. As the dollar goes back to its all time highs, the, U the world financial system just cannot survive on a strong dollar. It just doesn't function. So something is going to have to be done. And whether it's an overnight revaluation, another coordinated plaza accord type thing, it's going to have to be revalued. And when the, when the dollar starts going down and when they start doing things to weaken it, that's when the, the U.S. assets will lose value. That's when the stock market will crash. That's when gold's really going to shine. Because the final showdown that everybody's waiting for is definitely going to happen. And it's just like in Highlander, as there can only be one, at the end of the day, gold will beat the dollar. It's the one asset that can't be inflated away. It's the one asset that can't be destroyed in a deflationary collapse. So everybody should own gold, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Thanks for listening.